Hi, my name is Grant Kramer and I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today we'll be continuing my series on my plant physiology lectures. The environment influences plants very much. and Today we'll be talking about the effects of the environment on photosynthesis. Plant Physiology, Lecture 9, The Environmental Effects on Photosynthesis. The rate of photosynthesis is dependent upon the supply and demand of light and its ability to capture light, the CO2 concentration in the air. It's also based upon the carbon metabolism in the leaf, which involves the rubisco capacity, the regeneration of RUVP, and the metabolism of triose phosphates and on the demand, which is largely controlled by growth or sinks, so the development of new parts of the plant, or the development of fruits, or the storage of carbon as in the form of starch in the roots or in the trunk. So let's discuss first the capture of light. Photosynthesis is influenced by leaf properties. These are scanning electron micrographs of the leaf anatomy grown in different leaf environments. Note that the sun leaf is much thicker than the shade leaf, and the palisade cells of the sun leaf are much longer. An important aspect of light capture is the leaf area. Leaf area can be affected by leaf shape and leaf size, as well as the environment. Shown here are the percentages of light absorbed, reflected, and transmitted as a function of the wavelength of light. The transmitted and reflected green light in the wave band at 500 to 600 nanometers gives leaves their green color. Note that most of the light above 700 nanometers is not absorbed. So we can see that most of the light in the photosynthetically active radiation range between 400 and 700 nanometers is largely absorbed by the leaf. This figure shows you the spectral distribution of sunlight at the top of a canopy and under the canopy. You can see at the top of the canopy, there is a large abundance of wavelengths for the leaves to capture energy from the sun. However, Underneath all of that, the light is filtered, and there's very low levels of light in the wavelengths that are normally absorbed by the leaf. And it's only in the higher red range that we can see some increase in the wavelengths of light. This will become important when we talk about growth and the effects of light on growth and how it affects plants that are underneath the forest canopy. Leaf angle and leaf movement can also influence light absorption. Some plants are capable of tracking the sun. Their leaves will move during the day, tracking and following the sun. So this is a figure showing the response of photosynthesis to light in a C3 plant. And on the y-axis we can see the rate of photosynthesis and on the x-axis we can see the amount of light captured by a leaf. We can see that in darkness respiration actually causes a net loss of CO2 from the leaf. The light compensation point is reached when the CO2 fixation or photosynthesis equals respiration. Above that, light produces a net positive photosynthetic rate in linear fashion, proportional to the increase in light intensity. This is the light limited region. Above that, photosynthesis becomes limited by the carboxylation capacity of rubisco and the metabolism of triose phosphates. So if we compare these light response curves of the photosynthesis of both sun and shade plants, we can see quite a difference. Shade plants typically have low light compensation points and lower maximal photosynthetic rates 
than sun plants. A sarum caudatum is wild ginger. Atroplex triangularis is commonly known as saltbush and is a halophyte that is capable of growing in hot and salty environments. So this figure shows you the quantum yield of photosynthesis in a C3 plant versus a C4 plant. And if you recall, quantum yield is a measure of the efficiency of carbon fixation. So photorespiration increases with temperature in C3 plants. And the energy cost of net CO2 fixation increases accordingly. This higher energy cost is reflected in lower quantum yields at higher temperatures. In contrast, photorespiration is very low in C4 plants, and the quantum yield does not show a temperature dependence. Note that the C3 plants are more efficient than C4 plants at lower temperatures. This figure shows the light response of photosynthesis of a sun plant that's grown under sun and shade conditions. And what this shows is that most plants can acclimate to the light environment as seen here. The plants are able to adjust their photosynthetic capacities depending upon the light environment. Note that many plants are saturated well below the irradiance of full sunlight, which is 2000 micromoles per meter squared per second. In this figure, we can see the effect of light on a Sitka spruce tree, which has a complicated reaction depending upon the individual needles, the shoot, or an entire forest canopy. We can see that individual needles saturate at about 500 micromoles per meter squared per second. However, a shoot and a forest canopy don't saturate until about 1500 micromoles per meter squared per second. This is due to shading. So complex shoots consist of groups of needles that often shade each other. As a result, much higher photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, is needed to saturate photosynthesis. So what happens when a plant receives excess light energy? At levels of light above 150 micromoles per meter squared per second, photosynthesis begins to saturate. The excess light cannot be utilized and must be dissipated. So let's look at one way that light is dissipated when excess light energy is received. In the leaf, this excess light is dissipated by the xanthophyll cycle. As the amount of light increases during the day, a greater proportion of the viola xanthin is converted to anthera xanthin and then to zeaxanthin. These are the carotenoids we discussed in the light reactions in lecture seven. The light energy is released as heat during this process, dissipating the excess light energy and protecting the photosynthetic apparatus. Zeaxanthin is more effective at dissipating this light energy than the other two, and it therefore is very important in plants under high light stress. Leaves grown in the sun have substantially more of these xanthophylls than shade plants. High light stress can occur in desert climates, in drought stress plants, under high elevation, or in the winter when the photosynthetic rates are low due to cold temperatures. An alternative way of dissipating light energy is by moving the chloroplasts in the cell as seen here in the duckweed plant Lemna. Such movement of chloroplasts to the cell surfaces that are parallel to the light can reduce light absorption by as much as 15%. Blue light controls this movement through the molecule phytochrome, which is a light receptor that has a host of effects in plants. We will talk about the actions of phytochrome in a future lecture. If too much light is received for the plant, it can cause photoinhibition. Photoinhibition is caused 
by damage to the D1 protein in the reaction center of photosystem 2 of the electron transport chain in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. Here we can see the changes over the course of a day in the allocation of photons absorbed. So the blue lines represent absorbed photons. The red lines represent the photons that are dissipated. And in A at the top, we see favorable environmental conditions where that energy can be dissipated but there can also be favorable absorption of light and there's actual photons being involved in photochemistry. Under environmentally stressed conditions, we can see that almost all of the light that is absorbed by the leaf is also dissipated and very little if no photons are involved in photochemistry. Other ways the light energy can be dissipated are shown here through long wavelength radiation through cooling the leaf by air and evaporative cooling by water loss or transpiration from the leaf. So now let's discuss the effects of temperature on photosynthesis. Here we can see that photosynthesis increases with temperature and reaches a maximum and then declines with further increases in temperature. Examples here show a cool climate C3 plant and a hot climate C4 plant. Again, you can see that the C3 plant is more efficient than the C4 plant in the cooler temperatures, but the reverse is true at higher temperatures. This is a figure of the relative rates of photosynthesis between a C3 and a C4 plant for grass canopies in the Great Plains of North America. So on the y-axis here, we have the relative carbon gain. And on the x-axis, we have the latitude. And we can see that at lower latitudes, we have C4 plants being superior in what would presumably be warmer climates. And C3 plants are superior at the higher latitudes where cold climates predominate. Now let's look at the effects of carbon dioxide on photosynthesis. We know from past studies that the world atmospheric CO2 concentrations have been steadily increasing in recent years. Here is a diagram showing over the last 100 million years the carbon dioxide concentrations on the planet. And it's since about 1950 and the impact of the industrial revolution that we see that there are large increases and there are several predictions about where we might be in the future with different levels of increases in carbon dioxide depending upon what we can do to prevent or change that here's a figure of the rise in atmospheric concentrations over just the last 420,000 years. And we can see that there's rise and dropping of CO2 concentrations about every 100,000 years. However, more recently, we can see that there is a very large spike, which has increased from being below 300 to going well above 300. And now concentrations have actually reached above 380 and are above 400. So it continues to increase. As I said, this rise in CO2 concentration coincides with the Industrial Revolution and the use of fossil fuels. So to understand fully the impact of CO2 concentrations on leaf photosynthesis, we need to look at the pathway for CO2 concentrations. So in, in this figure, we can see the resistance pathways for CO2 that are represented by this resistance symbol on the arrow. And we can see on the lower edge of this leaf that we have one stomate or stoma that is open, which is a pore, and that CO2 can then enter by diffusion across the air through the boundary layer and into the leaf. So the one form of resistance that 
can be controlled by the plant very easily is by opening or closing the stomates. And so we have a large resistance barrier there when the stomate is closed. Once CO2 moves into the leaf, it enters into the intercellular airspace. And there's a natural resistance of movement of CO2 and diffusion, which is much faster than in liquid because it's in a gaseous stage. And once it reaches an actual cell, it runs into the liquid phase resistance. So there are different levels of CO2 resistance within the leaf until it gets to the actual site of photosynthesis in the chloroplast. Not only does light or drought affect leaf thickness, as we've already seen, but genetic diversity is large between different plant species as seen here. Nine different species with different leaf thicknesses, different amounts of airspace, and density and cell morphology. These differences will impact CO2 diffusion and transport through the leaf to the site of action for photosynthesis and result in different impacts on photosynthetic efficiency. So we can plot the rate of photosynthesis versus the rate of intercellular CO2 concentration inside the leaf. And that's what we see in this figure right here. So this plot of CO2 assimilation or photosynthesis against the internal CO2 concentration in the leaf is known as the A CI curve, CI referring to the internal concentration of CO2. And it can be used by the plant scientist to determine the limitations for photosynthesis. The linear slope in the lower intercellular CO2 concentrations reflects the amount of rubisco or the rubisco concentration in the plant. So a steeper slope represents a higher rubisco concentration in the leaf versus a lower slope. And the saturable part reflects carbon metabolism and the CO2 resistance through the leaf, as we just showed. CO2 compensation points are when photosynthesis balances respiration. And this is clearly higher for the C3 plants that must utilize photorespiration to salvage the CO2 due to the competitive binding of oxygen with rubisco. C4 plants have CO2 concentration mechanisms that we discussed in lecture eight, which prevent this competitive binding of oxygen to rubisco. This plot further indicates that the photosynthesis of C4 plants saturates at a much lower internal concentration of CO2 and that C3 plants are most likely to benefit from the rising world atmospheric concentrations with increased photosynthetic rates. And C4 plants are likely not to respond very much at all. So in this figure, we can see the combination of both atmospheric CO2 concentrations and daytime temperatures on the distribution of C3 and C4 plants. We can see that C4 plants are favored in warmer growing seasons or habitats, and C3 plants are favored in cooler seasons or cooler habitats. So in this figure, we can see the photosynthesis, transpiration, and stomatal aperture of a cam plant over the course of a 24 hour day. The shaded areas represent the dark periods of the 24 hour day. You can see that the stomates are open during this dark period and are closing during the light period in the bottom figure. We can see that CO2 assimilation or photosynthesis occurs during the dark when the stomates are open and water is lost at the same time in the dark because the stomates are open. And during the light period, the stomates are closed, but the plants are able to still assimilate or fix that carbon through the CAM pathway that we discussed earlier. If you're not familiar with that, then I suggest you go back to lecture eight and review that subject. CAM plants also have CO2 concentrating mechanisms as we discussed in lecture eight. Again, like C4 plants, rising CO2 
two concentrations are not expected to impact the photosynthesis of CAM plants. So today we've learned that there's strong environmental influences on photosynthesis, in particular the amount of light, the amount of temperature, and the amount of CO2 in the air. Plants have adapted in different ways. Some plants are adapted to warmer climates, some plants adapted to colder climates. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, then please like it on my YouTube channel, where you'll find other interesting videos on plant physiology, on grapes, on winemaking. Have a great day.